Welcome to an introduction to economics brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Park Bench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. This short podcast is about the public sector and methods of dealing with externalities. Externalities are gains and losses which are sustained by others as a result of actions initiated by consumers or producers for which no compensation is paid. One method of dealing with negative externalities is to use taxation. This does not get rid of the externality, it may reduce it, but it does place a cost on the activity. Consider the map shown. The demand curve is represented by DD, and the supply curve, as the sum of all the private marginal costs, is shown as S. At this point, a quantity Q is supplied at a price of P. However, there is an extra marginal cost, shown by the green line EMC. To compensate for the extra marginal cost, the good is subject to taxation, and the new supply curve is represented by a social marginal cost curve, SMC. This curve is made up from the original marginal cost and the additional taxation. The effect is to reduce the quantity supplied to Q1 and to raise the price to P1. You might consider whether the tax on gasoline falls into this category, or whether the demand is such that it has little effect on the total consumption. What happens when there is only one major supplier? In other words, does this idea work with a monopoly? Remember that a monopoly is a firm operating under conditions of imperfect competition. Here we have shown the demand curve and the marginal revenue curves. The private marginal costs, PMC, are shown as a supply curve before taxation and the social marginal costs, SMC, after taxation. Before any tax is added, the output is Q at a price of P. The Pareto optimal would be where the new marginal cost, the SMC, meets the demand curve. The output would be Q1 at a price of P1. The tax causes the firm to reduce output to Q2 and raise the price to P2. The opposite of taxation can be considered as subsidy for the purpose of considering an externality. Education would be considered as having a positive externality and as a benefit that increases social welfare. The benefit to the individual is increased earnings over a lifetime. The benefit to society includes increased productivity and the possibility that this will help to raise the incomes of others. The original demand curve is shown as DD, the private marginal benefit. However, it is then determined there is an extra marginal benefit, EMB, and the social marginal benefit produces a curve of D dashed D dashed. Before a subsidy, the quantity Q is provided at price P. If the extra marginal benefit is taken into consideration, then the demand would be Q1, an increase, but the price would also increase to P1. This would represent the Pareto optimal level, where social marginal cost is equal to social marginal benefit. To provide for the extra marginal benefit, the subsidy is taken to be equal to AB, the price representing the increase in demand. In the case of education to 18 years, then the government treats the situation as a pure public good and makes education free of charge. Above 18 years, there is much debate and little research on how much subsidy should be paid for university and college education. Where there is localised pollution, then there may be room for bargaining and agreements between polluters and sufferers. If the polluter has a right to pollute, for example, where there might be no rules governing emissions, then the sufferer might bargain to pay to reduce pollution. If the sufferer has a right for an uncontaminated environment, then the polluter might offer compensation in order to pollute. This might work on a local scale between two parties, but would appear as being of little use elsewhere. What happens in a situation where one firm produces or imposes an external cost on another. A possible solution is to merge two firms. Before a merger, then, a firm A produces quantity Q. After the merger, to take account of the external marginal costs, the new supply curve becomes SMC. The new quantity produced will be Q1. The reduction will take into account the external marginal costs. 
but it will also allow profit maximization since the marginal cost curve cuts the demand curve from below at the point where Q is the quantity produced. In many cases the only way to take into account negative externalities has been to impose rules and regulations. Legislation has been important in reducing emissions from power stations and from vehicles. It has also reduced noise levels in the work environment. Often legislation has been used in conjunction with taxation, as is the case to remove, reduce emissions from cars by taxation of gasoline. The amount of taxation or degree of legislation needed is not easy to ascertain, since there is a difficulty in ascertaining accurate costs. The method that is most favoured is to use cost-benefit analysis, to try and use monetary units to determine social costs and benefits. This has proved fairly effective in considering individual goods and services, but is less effective when considering aggregates. Since market prices will usually not reflect the, the true social marginal cost, the method of shadow pricing is often used. To estimate a social benefit from an improved faster train service, then the time saved could be measured with reference to the average wage. The value of street lighting could be measured in terms of less policing if it reduced crime. Government departments are frequently asked to produce figures for ministers to price projects or compare two different projects. To do this they need to measure benefits in terms of monetary units. However, they also need to take into consideration values at the end of the project. For example, at the end of a two-year project, an investment of $1,000 with interest rates of 10% annually will be worth $1,210. Or, in reverse, $1,210 in two years' time is worth $1,000 today at a current rate of interest of 10%. There are two rules on discounting which we shall consider. These are net discounted present value and internal rate of return. Net discounted present value determines the present value of costs and benefits associated with a project during the lifetime of the project. If the value is greater than zero, then the project is deemed acceptable. The formula for NDPV is shown given that B1 is the benefit in the first year, B2 the benefit in the second year, and so on until the end of the project in N years time. The interest rate is represented by I. The costs in year 1 are represented by C1, in year 2 by C2, and so on until Cn, where N is the lifetime of the project. The calculation here illustrates this formula in practice. A project has a lifetime of two years, where the initial outlay is determined to be $10 million, and in year 1 the benefit is $6 million, in year 2 the benefit is $7.25 million, and the interest rate is 10%. Substituting these figures into the formula, we have an NDPV of 1.44. Since this is greater than 0, the project is deemed acceptable. An alternative method is the internal rate of return method where the rate of discount is calculated and if this exceeds the current market rate of interest then the project is deemed acceptable. The formula is shown here and the figures from the previous example are used. The result gives a rate of return of 20% which is greater than the current rate of interest of 10%. What happens if the two methods show different results? This can happen if we are considering two projects and trying to compare them. In this case, the outlay for the two projects is the same, but one project has the return mainly for year two, the other has the benefits mainly in year one. The results suggest that by NDPV, the better project is A, but by internal rate of return, it is B. The practice is to accept the NDPV figure as this is considered to be conceptually correct. Cost-benefit analysis does have limitations. It does not consider for benefits the actual distribution of these benefits to society, so there may not be an increase in equity. 
The longer the period of time for a project, the more difficult it becomes to make accurate predictions, particularly with interest rates. Other factors, such as environmental pollution from noise, an important issue with new airports, are very hard to put a price on. However, the method has been of use when comparing two related projects, such as rail and road transport. It has proved less successful in trying to determine which is preferable when considering projects that are not related, as in health and education. Cost-benefit analysis has also proved to be of use for developing countries where there is likely to be large public investment in infrastructure. Frequently, this improvement has involved both government funding and private money. This ends our third podcast on the public sector, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.